Welcome to Massey Dialogues and to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session of Massey Dialogue. Massey College uh, is located on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yorunwanda, the Seneca, the Anoshone, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have today to discuss sustainability in academia and particularly at U of T. And I'm so delighted to have uh, with me today uh, Vice President uh, Maburi, who was, holds a PhD in agricultural and environmental chemistry from University of California, Davis. And he is the VP operations and real estate partnership. And there's so many things that, uh, that are reporting to him. Uh, IT, facilities and services, ancillary services, office of planning and budget. Uh, and I won't continue to examine, but we know that he is responsible for um, this, the way in which our campus uh, is developing, the way in which uh, the, 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 the infrastructure is developing around the campus, busy man. And he is a new senior fellow at Massey College, so I'm just so delighted that he agreed uh, to be with us today to discuss his vision of sustainability for the campus. And uh, I also, because the essence of Massey Dialogue is always that we have intergenerational uh, discussions, I've invited uh, Amanda Loader, who is um, PhD students in physical geography, environmental studies. She's a junior fellows at Massey College. Her research is really fascinating. It's quantifying carbon stores in wetland soils and their role in moderating the climate. I'm interested in this all the time because I was the minister <laughs> responsible for wetlands. So I'm always very keen to hear what Amanda is doing. And she has been at Massey College, part of the Environmental uh, Junior Fellows Group. So I welcome her as well. So let's start with you, uh, Scott. Uh, First of all, thank you so much for being here and uh, joining Massey today. Uh, and uh, the, my first question is really to uh, hear you a little bit about your vision for sustainability. How do you articulate this for uh, in the, an academic environment? Well, good. Thank you so much for the invitation and, and welcome. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And I, I like uh, sharing the stage with my uh, colleague because I'm being a farmer on the weekends. I, I deeply care about carbon and soil, and so uh, there's lots of, of symmetry here, uh, of synergy. So sustainability infrastructures, because the infrastructure of the University of Toronto, and particularly on uh, the St. George campus, but you know my portfolio spans the three campuses. Uh, we're deeply interested in the sustainability of those buildings, how they contribute to you know, the, the teaching and learning, research and discovery that goes on. Uh, it's our physical infrastructure that is meant to complement our human infrastructure, the professors and the staff and, and you know, the overall the students in, in that experience. The buildings have to function, they have to, to support that. Uh, those activities, but they need to be as efficient as possible. They need to be as efficient as possible. From a financial perspective, we have to buy the fuel to run them, but we're also, you know, ultimately accountable for those impacts of our buildings and our footprint, if you will, on, on the world. The University of Toronto has led in this regard, really, uh, certainly for over a, a century. So I think uh, we had some difficult issue with Scott there. I think the sound was terrible. But uh, Amanda, I'll have to start with you then, which, <laughs> which uh, was not the, the plan. And I hope he's going to be able to sign back in so that we can hear about him. So um, my sense is that uh, not only, I think as Scott was explaining, that sustainability of the infrastructure is important for efficiency purposes. It's financially the right thing to do, but it's also environmentally the right thing to do. But my sense is also almost a, a, a way for students to appreciate the commitment that students may have to, to, um, to what it is and wanting to be part of a campus that is sustainable uh, 
Am I right? Like, is it a tool of recruitment almost? I totally agree. I think it's both, yeah, like you said, being part of a community where you know action is being taken and, you know, your community is being a leader on these these issues. So, you know, not only within the academic institution are we learning about the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and, you know, human the human footprint on, on planet Earth. Uh, but I think students w- want to also see that, you know, about what we're learning, that we are taking action and doing our part in in the fight on these on these on these issues so in a way the the modeling that the that the university would do is almost uh, uh, helping us helping the community look at the problems and and the opportunity of sustainability but just seeing itself reflected uh, to that is that is that a fair way for students to look at this or I think it's a fair way to to look at it too, and I think you can incorporate uh, student ideas and you know get students involved in some of these these campus initiatives so that they can become uh, stu- stewards on on campus and not only gain the skills like within um, within undergrad but also be able to carry it forward and feel like you, and I think also just feel pr- more pride in uh, in what they've they've gained uh you know from from their degree but also just being a part of that that community that is taking taking leadership so i see that scott is back so uh thank you for uh, for for coming back i got a little bit frightened there so uh we were just talking a little bit about the the way sustainability was important for financial reasons, but also for community reasons. And maybe I just want to give you the chance to expose a little bit to your vision. Sure. Yeah, and I could hear you the whole time, but I was stuck in the green room, so I don't know what was going on. <laughs> anyway, I was I was saying that back in 1905, the University of Toronto uh, put in the first district energy system in Canada, and it remains one of the largest district energy systems, meaning we have a central power plant and we have a number of central chiller plants so that every time we build a new building we're not putting a power plant in those buildings Mm -hmm. it is much more efficient when i say efficient energy efficient Mm -hmm. to have a central and then distribute uh the energy out to when you need it and where you need it we can be much more efficient and i.e much more um carbon efficient in that regard Mm -hmm. so that was in 1905 coming all the way up to the present day where we're having very uh, significant objectives for 2030 and 2050 in particular. But my experience with this started a little bit. I want to point out a couple of things of how the University of Toronto is organized and why, how our organization helps us in this regard. And that's primarily how the University of Toronto budget works in that Mm -hmm. it's a, a responsive budget model it puts in the hands of those closest to the action the ability to make decisions and so about 10 years ago we created a green revolving fund and the point of this green revolving fund was to uh, take some central money we had and partner with divisions academic divisions and central service divisions uh, like the library to do energy efficiency projects um with that green revolving fund they pay the upfront capital cost we would then capture the savings the energy savings yeah. in those projects mm-hmm. and then uh re- replenish the green revolving fund but after that because our budget model mm-hmm. if medicine for example we did a project in msb we spent um about three million dollars taking mm-hmm. msb from a, a constant volume building where it didn't matter how many people were inside The air was heated or chilled, whether there's one person or 2,000, it was the same, into a variable volume building, meaning, you know, we'll do more heating and more air exchange depending on how many people in the building. It saves a million dollars a year in utility cost. All of those, once the capital was paid for, accrues back to the faculty of medicine and they hire faculty, they hire staff, they, they, they invest in their teaching and research mission. So that green revolving fund has $8 million in it and it continues to revolve. The second piece 
-hmm. when we're building new buildings, mm -hmm. just as anybody on this call, when you build a house, are you trying to build a net zero house? Are you trying to just do what's required? You know, how energy efficient do you want that house to be? Well, we have exactly the same conversations and our energy design standards are a result of a conversation my team and I had with deans because the deans are the ones who yeah. raise all the money and spend all the money. Mm -hmm. And we went to them and said, look, on a new build, you're going to spend about, and we use square meters. Mm -hmm. So on a square meter, you're going to spend about six or $700 building that square yeah. meter. And you're going to spend about probably two to $300 operating that mm -hmm. square meter per year, mm -hmm. um, energy cost, et cetera. Cause you, our budget model, whoever's using the energy pays for it. Yeah, so if you yeah, save yeah. it, you mm -hmm. save it. If you use mm -hmm. too much, you have to pay for it. So I, I said, look, if you spend an extra 10%, mm -hmm. you will get savings that will pay off your capital investment. Mm -hmm within 15 years. Do you agree <laughs> to the university putting energy efficiency standards into all new buildings as a requirement? And they said, yes, they will pay the upfront cost mm -hmm. because it will be paid back over time. And I think that's building a, a plan for how to move forward. While on the St. George campus by 2050, we expect to double the square footage of, of space on campus. And yet our, our goal and a commitment more than a goal is to by 2050 be carbon, net carbon positive, net climate positive, mm -hmm. better than net zero on a carbon mm -hmm. basis. It, we've already planned how to get there. Mm -hmm. It's 1.2 billion in cost. We have each component of how we're going to pay that 1.2 billion over the next uh, 30 years to be able to get to that. So it's an audible plan. It's not just an aspiration. It's not something that the president and myself and my various uh, uh, chief operating officer and my team have made a commitment that somebody after we're long gone has to figure out how to achieve. No, we delivered that only when we had a plan cost uh, yeah. peer reviewed uh, and we are beginning that journey and and I'll I'll just say one more thing it is starting very prominently mm -hmm. but in King's College circle in the project yeah. we call the landmark project which mm -hmm. is number one objective is to remove cars from the heritage core of the university simply mm -hmm. remove them from the landscape to put our faculty, staff, and students, and their relationship with the landscape and our heritage buildings, making them primary. Because frankly, right now, the car, two, yeah. park, you know, two lane parking, one lane of movement, you know, humans get about a meter, <laughs> nine meters for the car, uh, that's just nuts. So that's a project we're doing. But in doing that, we have to find a place to put those cars, so we're gonna put them underground. Mm -hmm. But we decided to explore what geothermal capacity, geo exchange capacity was there. And it turns out we can save every year 15,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide through 374 geo uh, exchange wells mm -hmm. that are 850 feet deep below King's College Circle. We've already drilled them. They're there. Yeah. Um, that is a significant contribute, contributor to our net climate positive 2050 mm -hmm. plan. Uh, it sets us up to do geothermal on effectively all future projects. Mm -hmm. um, we did another geothermal field under Robert Street Field, <coughs> excuse me, as part of the student residence we're building at Sussex's Spadina. All three campuses, we put a geothermal field under the new science building at UTM. There's a geothermal field under most new buildings going on at UTSC. So we have really optimized and maximized mm -hmm. both what's underneath our buildings and geothermal, what's on top mm -hmm. of our buildings with, you know, photovoltaics and some yeah. solar thermal in, in some yeah. buildings. But 
Yeah, to the, what I, I want to leave the audience with the, the impression is that we're not just saying stuff. Yeah, yeah. That other people like to hear. It yeah. is a firm commitment. It is well planned. It is integrated in our budget model. We have consulted deeply, and the grassroots, as represented by the deans, have said, yes, we buy into this. And I use that term carefully because they are the ones going to fund it. Mm -hmm. And in part, mm -hmm. being smart about this is that the vast majority of that $1.2 billion will be paid for by utility savings and mm -hmm. savings around uh, the carbon tax. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and really taking our resources and aligning them as smartly as possible. So the final thing I'll say is we're going to seek partners in this. Mm -hmm. we're, we're imagining green bond possibly. We're imagining partners with other government and non-government mm -hmm. uh, entities, mm -hmm. with both capital and expertise uh, that uh, we'll partner with to deliver on uh, this vision which I think is consistent with the principles and the values of the university. Well, it's, it's exciting and it's, uh, it's so interesting to, to hear you uh, being so committed and having this real plan. But you, you've talked a lot about new builds. Um, the George campus has a lot of old builds <laughs> and, and uh, um, uh, we live in one of them. Uh, but so what's, how do you manage this obstacle like that that's the, the how what are you going to do with all the the uh heritage protected uh buildings around uh, 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 within the portfolio as well sure so I, I mentioned the green revolving fund so we we did major retrofits in msb oise and uh robarts library each of them are currently now saving a million dollars every year in utility savings from moving them from a constant volume to a variable volume. Uh, Robert's library was was yeah. uh, using air like it had 8,000 people in it 24-7, 365, 8,000. Of course there's not 8,000 people. No. So now that building is more like a, a living, breathing organism, right? It, it'll breathe faster more depending on how many people are in it. Um, the Fitzgerald building down on College Street is a heritage yeah. building. It was grossly inefficient. We're in the midst of, of rehabilitating it now okay. for a shared service building. That building, we have a different set, but equally as rigorous energy efficiency standards for retrofits as nice. we do for new buildings. So new windows, mm -hmm. uh, interior insulation, uh, much um uh, more advanced and smart uh, HVAC systems uh, in that building, tapping into our geothermal and district energy systems. So it, it's a very, you cannot double the space at the St. George campus over the next 30 years mm -hmm. and yield our climate positive objective mm -hmm. without dealing with our existing uh, building stock. And so we will methodically work through the, the university. Uh, mm -hmm. And frankly, the worst, the most challenging buildings are the ones built in the 60s and 70s uh, because yeah. the internet was very cheap mm -hmm. until 73 anyway. Um, yeah. And thus they were not built uh, very efficiently and they weren't operated very efficiently. But all that's mm -hmm. been turned on its head. So we're very mm -hmm. methodically going through and have you know, we're, we have a, a number of buildings like CCBR and the Earth Sciences building that are relatively inefficient, certainly Earth Science, and that's a, a, a major objective retrofit project of which we're seeking external partners and, and funding partners mm -hmm. uh, to be able to set in motion an energy retrofit of that building that will make it as close to equivalent of a, of a new building structure uh, yeah. as mm -hmm. is practical. Wow, but this it's uh, it truly is exciting. So that's a, so. It, can you tell me how this compares to what's going on around the world, or is it is it is it particularly uh, linked to the UFT structure? And as you said, the budget model helps a little bit bringing people along on on your on your vision. But uh, are there examples elsewhere as well? Well, there are, but not. And there are probably some good ones, but frankly, what you had embedded in some of my uh, 
word choices were a little bit of frustration with some other universities, particularly in the United States, where commitments were made to be net zero by 20 whatever, yeah. with no absolutely no plan to get there, and from a distance looks impossible. So I find that not accountable and not very professionally responsible. So when when we approached Merrick and said, we believe we can have a 2050 objective, climate positive, net climate positive, mm -hmm. that no other university has done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's an auditable plan. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. got engineers who've helped uh, peer review it and design it. It's got a funding plan that matches us. Um, so I, I think it's fairly unique in that regard. There are lots of good examples, um, but I like ours the best with respect to it's of us and it represents why I think it'll outlive myself. It'll outlive other people involved now is because it's exemplifies our genetic makeup around how we're organized, that we're quite distributed. We have a budget model that's matches our org structure and how decision making is happening it's not a plan that's reliant on people still making the right decisions because we've set it up that you save money <laughs> that drives your decision making um mm -hmm. because one thing i've never had is anybody lobbying us to spend more on our utility bill so it's it's a <laughs> very you know one of your questions is what challenges have you had well i've never experienced challenges around Anybody arguing, we really should give Ontario Hydro more money. That's just not an argument I've ever heard. So, you know, if you align with, you know, the winds and the way they're blowing, mm -hmm. uh, and you're not trying to walk upwind or sail upwind, this is, um, this often is a good strategy. And I think we've found that uh, groove, if you will, mm -hmm. and that it's not being imposed. Uh, it is really a grassroots, uh, organized, supported, mm -hmm and designed around how we are organized and how we how we have become, and I'll just put a plug in, the University of Toronto has exactly the same funding model as every other university in Ontario. And frankly, mm -hmm. we have less money from the government than any other province in the country. Mm -hmm. And how does U of T get top 20 in the world, top 10 publics? Uh, we have just made collectively better decisions over the years um and used our resources more strategically and more effectively and we're taking the spirit and experience of that and applying it in the environmental sustainability realm to deliver value um to the institution advancing its mission and you know we're ambitious uh, because you know when we hire faculty at the university of toronto i'm a former chair i hired 11 people the only question when we really finally looked at a candidate, do you have the potential of altering how the world thinks about a question? Mm -hmm. Our standard is not, are you going to be the best in Canada? No, mm -hmm. that's just not there. So we approach, and certainly my team is consistent, we approach these problems. We, we want to do it better than it's been done before. Yeah. We want to do it to higher impact because impact and influence is really the the metric that universities, yep. um, that's how we compare ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to do this as well as it can be done. It's never okay, well, that's good enough. And mm -hmm. that's just not our our motivation. So the standard of excellence that permeates, I think the uh, our young students here and so on is the one that you apply to that project, I, I hear. Are they things that worry you at night? Like, do you foresee some obstacles? And and uh, what's what uh, what is there anything that could go wrong? Well, it, it would be interesting uh, if uh, government changed and the carbon tax disappeared. Then yeah. that would be a problem because uh, the, part of the motivation here is to avoid carbon tax increases. Yeah. Uh, and that's a very significant motivation and that would cause a challenge and, and that's a risk to our plan. Yeah. But we recognize it and we will identify mitigating strategies in that regard. And part of the reason for seeking partners mm -hmm. is to share that risk. I think uh, I don't lay awake thinking at night that the innovation capacity of our faculty, staff and students mm -hmm. is going to let us down. Uh, we have some of the most talented, most productive um, 
researchers in the world in this space. And we are reliant over the next three decades for, for a number of those things to yield benefits yep. Yep. for us in that regard. So I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. I think, I think one of the benefits um, in our new uh, landmark project, we're continuing a, a theme of having our physical plant be part of the educational um, domain of our students and faculty. And in that, um, under, we have a classroom underground that's going to allow students and faculty and staff to explore and learn about the geo exchange system. Um, and more broadly, uh, you know, tapping into the creative minds, the, the ambition, the excitement, the uh, really the energy of our students in particular uh, in our physical plants. Um, I think is part of that. It's it's more interesting for our technical staff, right? They mm -hmm. mostly work alone. They're the building yeah, engineers, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And so having students interface and be mm -hmm. interested and asking pointed mm -hmm. questions, mm -hmm. um, I think keeps everybody a little more stimulated. Mm -hmm. We're all faced after long periods of COVID, me sitting alone in my office, <laughs> of, of not being as stimulated by the university mm -hmm. environment as the norm would have mm -hmm. and i deeply miss it but with that idea and i i now will forever value it more than i did before mm -hmm. it's just sort of natural when you lose something but you know i think it's really important to have our physical plant be accessible to our students and that mm -hmm. you know living lab component of that mm -hmm. um, is is a key component of i think a, a you know an opportunity the university of toronto brings to this uh, subject mm -hmm. but no, there's not much that keeps me up in this regard. Um, because we're, it's just when you have a good plan uh, mm -hmm. and it's been costed, and you have mm -hmm. you know unanimous buy-in, if you will, from mm -hmm. the stakeholders, you know, then you're set for success. And challenges mm -hmm. will come up, but boy, I have deep faith in in the team uh, mm -hmm. that they will address those challenges um, uh, as we move forward. And, and frankly. The, the question is, can we get more ambitious as we get closer and closer? Yes. To mm -hmm. That's really, uh, you know, how big that opportunity is, is a question mark. So let me uh, bring Amanda here now, the, the student voice, you know, the ones that uh, uh, hears that. And uh, we were talking earlier about how much. Uh, so I think if Amanda has disappeared, then uh, uh, that that will have been quite the dialogue today where my guests disappear the, me the moment that I want to talk to them. Um, so if, uh, oh, here you are. So um, I'm back. <laughs> you're, listening to, you're listening to this excitement. It almost feels like a, being part of a, a fabulous research project that is, you know, grounded in values and that brings result right away. Is that the way you feel about it? How, how known is it in, among the student body? Well, I guess coming back to, uh, you know, King's King Circle, I think, you know, I think that is certainly well known. And you can just see some of those changes that are on on the ground right now at U of T. Um, I think what would be great to make it what really well known among students is uh, being able to show, uh, you know, some of the how some of these steps are going to be taken and then demonstrating the progress along the way and the reduction in emissions as we go year to year, get closer to 2030 and then closer closer to uh, to 2050. Uh, I think I was just writing some some notes uh, based on based on the conversation that uh, has been had so far. And I think given university students are the future and the climate crisis is has is going to have such an impact on future generations. I think it does bring, you know, seeing some of these bold actions brings hope and and energy to the student body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hope. That's true. We, uh, we've been talking a little bit about that when we talked about climate change yesterday uh, with the Lieutenant Governor about how do we create hope. So Scott, let me bring you back in. Maybe we'll just be the three of us if we can about um, did I mean, to me, when I hear you, I hear the scientist, <laughs> you know, that the, uh, as well as obviously the, the VP operations and the person that has make the, the, the budget work and having been a, uh, you know, uh, a chair, but I, it's, it's exciting to see a project like this that seems to be almost uh, 
you're going to publish about this, you're going to have, you know, it will be studied and, and so on. Are you uh, documenting it for, uh, for publication? We are, we, the landmark project itself is, is definitely, we have a photo journalist who's mm -hmm. um, uh, marking the, the various stages and will be here for the balance of the projects, so certainly visually and the, and the transformation of, you know, the heritage core from, you know, really recapturing what it would have been like when uh, UC was first built and King's College Circle was first built when cars were, weren't a thing yet, you know, pre-1900. Um, there's a number of faculty with various projects going on uh, and a number of engineering faculty, both, I think, both research, but also certainly educational around this. Because we, you know, a number of years ago, uh, we committed to having our physical plant available as a living laboratory for mm -hmm. the university's uh, academic community. So uh, I'm, I'm generally aware of a number of things going on mm -hmm. there. But, you know, universities like us, um, so we do have uh, one major convert carbon dioxide to, frankly, a useful plastic making material that came out of Ted Sargent and, and Dave yeah. Simpson's laboratory. Uh, they were part of the X Prize. Uh, didn't quite win, but came very close. But we we'd invested in that, so we took theirs back in, and we're going to put this in one of our power plants and and start doing those kinds of components. And that's the kind of research, practical, applied, um, trying to squeeze more innovation out of our existing uh, systems mm -hmm. uh, that I have a lot of faith in. Uh, our engineering faculty are you know just exceptional, uh, and as they fit in more broadly with the broader sustainability community through the social sciences, humanities, the other sciences, um, fully expect a lot of, of research, broadly defined, I guess, uh, to come out of this. Because um, it's not normal for a university necessarily to make its physical plant open <laughs> to university's academic community. That Those, you know, don't yeah. always uh, meld perfectly. It's helpful. I'm an academic, so you know I'm able to um, translate, if you will, sometimes for my operations people of why. Um, right. mm -hmm. But I, I hinted at it a little bit earlier. It is amazing when you put a young, excited, enthusiastic, maybe probably wet behind the ears uh, uh, student in with you know a hard bitten. Uh, <laughs> plant operator, you know, she's been there for decades, you know, that's, that's a perfect growth opportunity uh, for both participants in that, um, in that scenario. And I like that. Um, I mean, somebody who's about ready to turn 60, <laughs> literally, you, you have to thinking, okay, so how do I not get stuck? Uh, and certainly during COVID, you know, it, it's front of mind. How does one stay mm -hmm. uh, stimulated? How does one uh, adapt to changing circumstances? Uh, and and frankly, how do we not get stuck and rutted? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, those are the kinds of thoughts I have in that regard. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, my goal is just to hire the best, smartest people I possibly can mm -hmm. and get out of their way. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, certainly I think the intergenerational aspect of, of this uh, project, you know, uh, is something that I sympathize with. I mean, I, that's the beauty a little bit of here and of this, this um, even the, the philosophy behind the dialogue. So let me uh, bring Amanda back here and say, would you go and, and uh, are you going to go and visit the physical plant? Would you go to the, 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 the lab? On, uh, 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 to, I mean, uh, I always like learning opportunities and learning more about uh, <laughs> energy systems and just way to be more environmentally sustainable. But I can imagine as in for undergrads, that would be a really cool experience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just learning about it. It's one thing learning about it in the classroom, but being able to see it firsthand is, uh, is it's, yeah, really helps, uh, helps take in, take in the material and learn, learn the concepts. So one question that I have for both of you a little bit is um, we talk about sustainability uh, at, at UFT. We talk about how does it relate to the city? 
and is is the the experience that you have here and i'm uh that you're developing this large project of, of accountability of is that exportable is that can you see how the city of toronto or uh, uh may look to this and and um, get some lessons out of it scott well, I can say we, we um, there's a special bylaw for U of T. Um, <laughs> it says, thou shalt meet with your neighbors four times a year. Nobody <laughs> else has that uh, wonderful benefit. Uh, our neighbors being the folks living, you know, to the to the east mm -hmm. and north, south and, and, and west of us in particular. Um, uh, our counselor, um, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Layton, is particularly excited about our plan, our approach to this, the Robert Street Field geothermal uh, field, for example, the potential, and, and we'll be having a conversations with Mike about, he would love to catalyze the university partnering uh, with other developers, delivering you know, the residential communities, uh, the towers and the various, you know, across the streets from us, whether or not we, they could tap into our district systems. Yeah. Because that's the, you know, that's the thing U of T brings, the, the idea of a district energy system. Scandinavia has been all over this for decades and decades, like, you know, like we have. But it's fairly new in, in or certainly modest uh, in the broader Canadian context. There are others, but not of our scope and scale, as, as I understand it. Uh, but, but it's just inherently more efficient to produce your energy in a, in a, in a, uh, scale and efficiency often go together in, in one place. It's less polluting. I could be much more efficient in distributing that. And it's also financially more uh, efficient because mm -hmm. spending uh, the capital cost of a large uh, thermal unit, for example, uh, is much less than 35 or 40 individual uh, powerhouses mm -hmm. for individual yeah. buildings. So you know, it's a model more broadly that the city could uh, try to emulate by partnering. Um, so those are conversations just starting. Uh, you know, those are a bit fraught. Um, but nonetheless, we we uh, have experience with joint ventures and building student residences. We're going to have joint ventures in building innovation space. We, we seek out expertise. And in this space, we're seeking out private sector expertise on energy projects. Um, ones that that are designed around saving money, saving money by lowering utility costs, which of course aligns with yeah. we want to reduce our carbon footprint, mm -hmm. uh, and we want to do it the most financially feasible way possible. So we seek partners in that regard, and, and we view the city as a partner uh, wherever possible. So Amanda. Uh would you see yourself kind of talking about this more with students? That's uh, it, it, were there things that you did not know as part of this conversation? Uh, I guess if we're talking in terms of the, uh, the, the, I suppose I have followed, you know, the sustainability plan and what, you know, this, the new uh, goals that U of T has set for reducing its carbon footprint going 2030, and into 20, 2050. Um, perhaps going forward, I could see, uh, I can, you know, I think it will become more and more obvious, especially with the like King's, King's Circle uh, and uh, some of those larger, larger scale projects that are that are on ongoing. Um, and I think kind of coming back to, you know, having students on campus again, uh, I think that just <laughs> creates more stimulation, more buzz and more talk among among each other. Uh, I mean, coming back to that, I really feel, you know, when the I'm, I, I come, I still come, I'm a, I do lab work. So uh, mm -hmm. we do still have, uh, we do still have some of that ongoing uh, with the despite the restrictions. And I just find campus with an undergrads is just so quiet and when undergrads are back you just really feel that energy mm -hmm. uh, so i think for you know some of these some of these projects having the students you know on campus you know in in person and being able to see what's happening will in and of itself create uh yeah create conversation yes i i mean i think part of it is we we want to make sure that uh students see the benefit of it so, you know how do they uh, see the benefit of it 
for themselves. I mean, certainly by uh, being part of a community that cares about the environment and reduces its footprint is is in itself a benefit. Any other uh, uh, any other benefit that you see to students, uh, Scott, outside of the fact that obviously if the university is saving money, it it will uh, invest in uh, the great academic projects that that it wants to support, but uh, any other benefits for students? Well, I think um, having having a university um, plan so seriously and take and be held so accountable. I mean, it's not an accident that we're out there saying climate positive by 2050. It's a differentiator to other universities. Mm -hmm. to say it's planned, uh, it's budgeted, uh, we're setting up clear lines of being held accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not afraid of accountability. And in fact, um, I think the benefit for students will be, uh, you know, having as an alma mater once they graduate, uh, a university that will garner some profile mm -hmm. for showing how this is possible uh, and how uh, it can be achieved. Uh, within uh, the, the conditions that exist uh, for all Canadian universities. Um, this is a lot more difficult to do here than it is in Southern California. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did my PhD, as you noted, at UC Davis, right? The current California currency is sunshine. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have minus 30 Celsius <laughs> uh, temperatures, right? So they don't have to burn stuff to stay warm. They just don't. And um, so we have a much more challenging component. But if we can do this, UCLA can do this. But UCLA has got a much further journey than we do because mm -hmm. their current carbon emissions are something like three times ours. So, you know, 300% of ours. I think they're north of 300 tons, uh, 300 million tons. So, I'm getting some questions yeah. here. So, uh, uh, Bob Becker wants to know uh, if mass timber buildings fit into the sustainability plan. Of course they do. And we will start construction, we hope, this summer mm -hmm. on what would be the tallest, largest mass timber building in North America at the corner, just south of the corner of Devonshire and Bloor. Uh, the Academic Wood Tower will house four separate academic divisions. Um, it's, it graces many of our reports. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> the only challenge right now is the, the construction marketplace and the wood prices. Uh, I know. <laughs> it's scary, but um, uh, we expect to have the final cost estimate for that uh, in about three weeks' time. And I'm hoping. Wow. Uh, uh, it's, we hope. Uh, to start construction and go to the market, start going to the market, buying the timber now, um, so that we can, you know, long lead mm -hmm. items and get it. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, my answer to it, it is definitely, yeah. and we want to demonstrate that wood is one seventh of the weight of steel yeah. and concrete. So mm -hmm. there are lots of buildings where we think, well, we need more space. It, the, the foundation won't hold up another two floors. So we have to demolish and build over. Boy, if we can avoid demolishing, that's, you know, environment. So wood gives us the ability to add floors on building mm -hmm. because their existing foundation likely has the ability to hold it up because it's so much lighter. Well, it's uh, music to my ears to hear about this because that was a, a big issue when I was in government as well. So I have another question here about whether the, the size of U of T um, hurts or helps in achieving its goal in, in implementation of a sustainable plan? Well, I came here from the University of California, Davis, mm -hmm. uh, and I did my undergrad at a liberal arts college in the States that had 500 students. <laughs> the University of Toronto was more nimble than my little college was in Northern Wisconsin. Uh, and there, there's all kinds of reasons for that. We're, we're, I think our scope and scale is only a, a net good thing. We are administratively very flat. Some people may, what are you talking about? But the fact of the matter is when I came here in 95, within one week as a new assistant professor, I had met and had a substantial conversation with the, the chair, the dean, the provost, the president, and the VP research. 
the five most important people to a faculty member's life. Mm -hmm. I asked my PhD supervisor, how often did you talk to the dean? Never, president, mm -hmm. never. So yeah. this institution is organized around an ability to move very fast when it's prudent to do so. Uh, most of the time, that's not prudent, but I have yet to have any impediment around this topic ever, and that the size, scope, and scale is just a net benefit. Um, I, I just don't have difficulties in being nimble uh, when that makes sense and when that will pay a dividend. So we're coming to the end of our, of our uh, conversation here. So um, I want to ask uh, both of you just what you would like the, the, the audience to remember from this. I, I, I suspect I know what Scott's going to say, but, uh, but Amanda, what, what would you like the, 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 the audience to remember from, from today? Oh, good question. Uh, I would say, you know, our in larger institutions, taking leadership and i mean of course this was already talked about having a plan and planning to have accountability i think that accountability is really is really key i feel like you know often there are you know plans and a lot of talk and such but i think really seeing things moving on the ground and also knowing that uh a, yeah a plan has been devised based on evidence and markers are set to ensure that things move forward. I think is really uh, is exciting and and quite positive. And I really I hope the audience takes away that uh, you know these kind of large scale projects are happening and that there will be more to come. Scott, your final words. I can't, Amanda. Bullseye. I I have nothing to add. That that accountability. There's there's, it's part of the design to be held accountable. Well, thank you. I, I want to say it's very exciting. It was very exciting to have you here, uh, uh, VP Mabry, to explain to us this vision of sustainability and to see the accountability framework uh, uh, around it. I think we, it completes very well all the climate change discussions that we have had at Massey and that we hope to continue to have. So uh, I want to thank you both for uh, for participating. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Scott. And thank you to the uh, tech team for uh, uh, coping with all our difficulties here. And thank you to the audience. Uh, thank you for your questions. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Principal DeRuzzi. Thanks. Au